I was thinking when I came up with that title, I don't know that I know many people physically whole, emotionally stable, and spiritually free. I mean, that, that you're just perfect then. Um, but then last night, I, I decided not to do that one. And what I'm going to do is part two of Hungry for a, a Move of God. Um, that I, I just did not finish in some of the last points I rushed through and I thought, Lord, that's that's where my heart is. I I have a, a passion for you and I have a hunger for you. I have a desire for intimacy with you. And I that, and so that's what's really on my heart again, rather than just do a teaching. I, I felt, well, I'll I'll, uh, I'll go back and pick up some of the things that I didn't cover before. And actually, I've added some other things to it as well. And so this morning, again, I want to talk to you about hungry for a move of God. Just so, um, by way of encouragement, that I will know I'm among the right people. How many of you are hungry for a fresh move of God? Uh, you want to see it in your life. You want to see it in your church. You want to see it in your city. You want to see it in Australia. Um, this sounds a little like an overstatement, but everywhere I go, I look for uh, that next hot spot. Where, where is God going to break out in such a way that people are just overwhelmed? I told you the story about my grandfather pointing out to me or allowing me to see the glory of, of the Lord. Um, I, I, everywhere I go, almost without fail, it wouldn't be 100% of the time, but probably 95 to 99% of the time, I stand up and I, I remember that event and I think Lord is today going to be that day when we see the glory again come where we can sit with the natural eye. Now, I, I know a lot of people see the glory with their spirit. Uh, they sense the glory, but I it is it, I'm just I'm telling you, I saw it as if you were to build a fire in the room filled with smoke in the natural. And so I, I stand always looking. And I, this morning I got up about five o'clock just to do some praying and thinking through what I wanted to do. And I, I just said, you know, Lord is today that day. And to be honest with you, I don't really care whether I'm doing the preaching or the teaching. It doesn't matter to me whether it's Will or Randy or Pastor John or somebody giving a testimony. It would just, I'd just be awesome to see that and experience it once again. And I, I live with the promise that it's going to happen. Let me do a, hopefully a five minute review of what we covered, um, Thursday, I think it was Thursday, and then I'll, I'll move into uh, some of the stuff that we didn't get to cover. If you were taking notes, you'll remember that the first major point I made was make having his presence a priority. In other words, a passion for him. I think you have that. Uh, I think that's the way all of us ought to live our lives. I know it may manifest itself in different ways, but every one of us, and I do, I have a passion for him. It's the way I've lived my life, this way I live my ministry. Now, I got a greater revelation of what that means with each encounter with him. Uh, I was passionate about the Lord when I first got saved, when I accepted Jesus as my Savior. But it's taken on a new level of intensity as time goes along. I, I got a greater revelation understanding of what that, what that, that means. Um, I was so passionate about him when I was saved. I was saved out of uh, alcohol and drugs and some other stuff that I won't go into. I, I just knew at that moment that I was supposed to be in ministry. And within a few weeks, told my pastor. Uh, so I was, and this, you know, it sounds strange, but in two weeks, I was teaching Sunday school. And then I told you three months later, I preached my first sermon and preached everything I knew in 10 minutes. Um, but it, it set me on a journey. And I, I believe... I know this is not the case with everyone, but I believe for myself right now, I have a greater passion for his presence than I did when I first became a Christian. We talk about losing our first love, and I know people do, but I, I have that passion for him. And enough said, that's the first major point is make having his presence a priority. The second one is to develop an attitude of expectancy. Uh, position yourself. Position yourself to catch the next wave. Develop an expectancy. We can sit back and say, okay, God, if you're going to come, come. You're sovereign. I don't have anything to do with it. Just now come and blast me. Or you can lean in and, and lean in with an expectancy. I remember the early days of the renewal. I honestly 
did not sit in the back of the church. No offense to those of you that are sitting back there. Everybody can't sit down front. But I would get as close as I could get. I would stand in line for hours in order to get in so I could get close because I didn't care what they were going to teach on. And and to be honest with you, here's confession. I didn't really go to hear what they were teaching anyway. I didn't really care what they were teaching on. I was going after God. I was going after the anointing that they had on their life. And it didn't matter to me what they were teaching. I was going to be the first one down and and try to get hands laid on me. And so I would actually, um, like Randy, cheat to try to get in line more than twice. Now, there was always something about me. I remember uh, several times, Toronto, Brownsville as well. They're going down the line. They're praying. They're praying. They're praying. And they used to, my friends used to make fun of me because they'd go to reach for me and touch somebody else. And I, you know, I went through a little bit of rejection there. What's wrong with me? Uh, now, I know the Lord was wanting me to keep my eyes focused on him, but I pressed in. So I positioned myself to catch what was going on. I, I, I developed an attitude of expectancy. So that was the second major point. The third one was allow God to touch you first. We want a fresh move. We want revival. We want an outpouring Let it begin with you. Say, Lord, let it start here. I use the illustration of 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 not only positioning ourselves, but being the one who creates the wave. And someone came up afterwards and I I don't want to misquote you, but there was a vision or a prophetic word. It just very recently in their small group or their church where they saw a brick being thrown into the lake and out went these ripples. And so I, I said to the Lord this morning as I was praying, I said, Lord, you know, uh, let me be the rock that you throw into the water. Let me be the one that you toss into the river that creates those ripples. Now, when we're saying, Lord, let me be first, it's it's not a matter of arrogance that we think it depends on us. I think the Lord is looking for volunteers. Now, I know he drafts people. In fact, when I got saved, I was shocked that I got saved. I went home uh, to, I was at the University of South Carolina and had, uh, as I mentioned, been involved in some things I shouldn't have. I went home to date a girl. And when I got there, uh, she said, well, okay, we, we can still date, but you got to go to church. Uh, I didn't go the first night. I went in my party thing. And the next night I, I told her, I said, okay, I'll go with you. I've done the church thing. Uh, I was raised in the church. I know how to do this. In fact, it was my home church. I was surprised that uh, there was this revival in, in this little dead church. But I said, I know how to do this. And and uh, so I went with her that night and I'm s- sitting in the congregation. And without really thinking about it, I find I got long hair and I find myself on the floor in the altar crying out for the Lord to save me. Uh, they all made fun of me because I just, you know, I was this cool dude. I became unglued and got up and I thought. How did that happen? I don't I to this day don't remember walking to the front. I I don't know if I was transported. I'm being a little bit facetious, but I mean, I don't know how I got there. So I know the Lord drafts us sometime. Um, In fact, I went back to the university. I said my my folks said, you know, Tom, if you don't want to go back to school, you don't have to. I'd already paid for the semester, but I knew I couldn't stay a believer and go back into that environment. So I quit uh, two days later. I went back and told my roommate and my friends, I I can't do this any longer. I've given my heart to the Lord. So I know the Lord drafts us, but I want to volunteer and say, Lord, let me be the rock that you throw into the water. Okay, I've got to be careful. I'll reteach this whole thing. Uh, And then the fourth major point we, we made is be open to the things that we don't understand. And that is a challenge for us, especially as pastors. Uh, I did some evaluation, self-evaluation during that period of time. And I came to the place where I, I, I recognized that if I wasn't careful, I would be more concerned about the favor and the affirmation of people than I was the presence of God. Now, I know, again, you guys don't struggle with those kinds of things here in Australia, especially Perth. This is heaven. Um, but we people in the United States struggle with those kinds of things. And and as the, the Holy Spirit is being poured out on my church, I, I I'm looking at it in dollars and cents and thinking, you know, if this goes on and this continues, I'm going to keep losing people. 
And I had to reach a place where I said the presence of God in my life and in this church is more important than the favor of people or the favor of my denomination. Now, thankfully, God in his mercy blessed us. We were one of those churches that did not decrease. We, in fact, continued to grow, set records every year in giving. And we started to build our building. I, the comment I made to our leadership board, I said, guys, uh, OK, we can do this. I said, but we need to understand that I don't care how desperately we need money. Man is not going to become the focus. The presence is going to still be here no matter who we lose. Um, and again, the Lord in, in his mercy blessed us, uh, and we continued to grow. We continued to grow and, and financially and, and numerically. Now this moves me to, uh, the fifth major point that I just touched on, but I did not develop. And it's number five is learn to host the presence of God. If you would go ahead and if you have your Bibles, turn to first Ch Samuel chapter five. We're just going to touch on a couple of scriptures there because this point actually and the re one of the reasons I decided to go back and deal with this is because it is very important learning to host the presence of God. Are you there? First Samuel chapter five. Just hold that place um, while I, I share a couple of thoughts with you. And I, I just didn't want you turning or me talking while you were you were turning. The first thing in, in hosting the presence of God is, and it's a very simple principle, is make room. You remember when uh, uh, Mary and Joseph was headed toward Bethlehem and they get to Bethlehem and there was no room for him in the inn? I, I think that there are times the Holy Spirit is wanting to show up, but there's no room for him. So the, the first principle or the first concept or idea about hosting the presence of the Holy Spirit is make room for him. Uh, <laughs> if you're going to host me in your in your home, you first of all need to clear out a bedroom. So I've got a place to, to rest. I've got a place to be. It's sort of hard for you to host me if you make me sleep out on the lawn. If you make me sleep out on the porch. So to host the presence of God, we as individuals need to make room for him in our lives. Um, a little later, if I get that far, I'll talk about some reasons that we don't. But we can have our lives occupied with so many things that we don't make room for him in our lives. I've gone through that. By the way, you can be pastoring a very successful church. You can be a, a spiritual leader. You can have all kinds of wonderful things going on but not make room for the presence of God in your life. Okay, let's just find out. You're very quiet. Has anybody else ever done that in their lives? I mean, you're so busy with church or, you know, uh, only 10 of you. Um, uh, has anybody told you lately where liars go? Um, no, just kidding, just kidding, just kidding. Don't, but, I, I mean, we, we have to make room for him, and there have been times... I mean, we can travel all, all the way around the world. I, I've gone through seasons where I'm so busy and I've got so much going on that I do not make room for him. And if I want to host his presence, I need to make room for him. Now, pastors, uh, let me tread on thin ice just for a moment. Just consider this. We also have to make room for him in our services. Now, those of you who are not pastors, I'm going to give you a charge. I'm going to charge you with something. You are not allowed to go home and tell your pastor, Pastor Tom Jones at that conference said you are to make room for the Holy Spirit to move. No, you can't do that. That has to be something that is between that pastor. And I understand. See, I am a pastor. I is the way I see myself, I'm not an evangelist. I am not a prophet. I'm not an apostle. I am a pastor teacher. That, as far as my DNA, who I am, I, I see myself, what I feel like I am as a pastor. And I pastored. And I understand, pastors, the tension of the practical side of getting all that needs to be done in a service and also making room for the Holy Spirit. There was a tension that I constantly live with. 
in, in trying to make sure this happened. Before we had two buildings, um, I, we had an 830 service. And we, it, was our, uh, it was full. We had to get the people in, uh, do all the things that we would do, and have the Holy Spirit show up and then get them out so we could get the next group in. And it started at 1045. So I understand the tensions of that. I often have gone back and, and just said, what would I have done differently if I was a pastor? Uh, uh, what, would have I, what would I have done different at Suncoast Worship Center? One of the things that I decided is I would have made more room for the Holy Spirit. Now, this is just me. I, 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 one of the things I decided I would change is I probably wouldn't, I probably wouldn't have preached as much as I preached. In the sense that there were times I may have shut things down because I had things I wanted to say. Now, understand the importance of the word. I mean, you know, you, I, I, I hate to balance everything that I say, but you, you understand there's always a flip side to the principles and the concepts that we're talking about. But the, and, and the teaching of the word is important. You've got to have the word. It's got to be in your spirit. The pastor needs to be teaching the word. But there were times, I think, I sh- could have just let it go. Uh, one of those things, again, I discovered is that the Holy Spirit can do more in a second than I can do in a message. I, I see. You're just so impressed with my wisdom. You are awed by it. I mean, you're thinking, wow, where did he come up with those things? You know, I, f- I found that God can do more in a second than I can do in a message. I loved it when I would stand at the back of the church or people would come up after the service and say, oh, pastor, thank you for saying this. And thank you for communicating this to us. And I would say, I have I wouldn't say it, but I'm thinking. I have no idea what you're talking about. I never said that. That's not even anything that was in my mind. But the Holy Spirit spoke that to them. So he can do more in a second than we can do uh, in, in, a, in a message. Now, again, pastors, I'm not fussing at us. I, I, I actually feel the, the ice cracking now. I know I'm walking on thin ice here. But I, I, I do. I speak to you as a pastor. I realize the tension of making room for the Holy Spirit. And then also doing the other things that we need to do. Um, I mean, we, we need to, t- to take up our tithe and offering. We need to have the other things. But make room for the Holy Spirit. So that's the first thing under hosting the presence of God is make room uh, in our lives and make room for him to move if we're pastors in our services. The second thing is, again, very simple, but tune in. If you want to host the presence of God, tune in to him. Bill Johnson is... My favorite teacher. Uh, Randy's not here. So outside of Randy. uh, Outside of Will. Outside of Will and Randy. My favorite teacher is. Is Will here? Okay. He's not here. Okay. Bill Johnson is my favorite teacher. I love listening to Bill. I. I, uh, If I'm a little bit distracted before I go overseas. Or if I'm going to speak somewhere. I'll put on a Bill Johnson tape and listen to him. And then I'm inspired and I can do what I need to do. So I, Bill has taught me a lot of things. And one of the things that is really is stuck in my spirit is this idea of living life intentionally. It's very easy to get up out of bed in the morning, put our lives on automatic, and then just start living our lives. We go to work, we do this, we have lunch, come have dinner, take care of the kids, we put them in bed, and we go to bed, and we get up the next day. And we don't live life intentionally. We haven't tuned in. And it, it, for me, it's like taking one of the old radios, you know, and you just sort of, and it, you know, static. And you finally tune it in. If you live out in the outback, maybe you do that. I mean, you, now we hit it and it's digital and it goes right to it. But you sort of tune it in. These were radios back in my grandparents' day. Um, you, you tune it in until you find the right station. There are times that I find in my life, I just have to tune in the frequency of heaven. Have you ever found out that you have to do that? There's all of this static. There's all of this background noise. There's all of this stuff going on. And if I'm not careful, I don't tune in to the presence. I, I, um, I, I just had to learn to walk my life with an awareness. An awareness of who he is. That's very important. An awareness of who I am. Very important. Those two go together. I have to get up. And, and if I don't do this intentionally, and I understand different personalities uh, 
function different ways. But if I don't get up and just intentionally say and just dial down, tune in heaven and, and just be aware of his presence, then I, quite often I'll run through the day and not sense anything. I will host his presence and he will be with me. He is with me wherever I go and he's with you. But I won't be aware of him there. I won't I will I will not have taken the time to tune him in. So we need to take the time to tune in the Holy Spirit and just it's it's almost like you just you encourage yourself in the Lord. You make yourself aware. OK, in fact, just do that right now. Just close your eyes just for a moment. And, and I know I'm running short on time here, but close your eyes just for a moment. Just take, take, take a deep breath. And I'm not talking about yoga, meditation in that sense or anything. Just, just dial down and let yourself be aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Ooh. Just keep your eyes closed another moment. Don't you sense him? Just, just open your eyes. I mean, just open your hearts, open your spirits and see him. See, you, you're at this moment tuning in. The frequency of heaven. So. Number one is make room for him. If you want to host the presence of the Holy Spirit, if you want to host the presence of God, make room for him. And then secondly, tune him in. And then the third thing um, we find in, in three or four chapters of first Samuel, beginning with about chapter four through um, chapter six, I think, is. Make sure that the presence of God is not subordinate to anything else in your lives. If we are not careful. Well, let me just let me give you the scripture here. Let me talk to you about it and I'll, I'll explain what I mean. Uh, at this period of history. In Israel's history, uh, Eli was the was the judge and Samuel, you know, was the up and coming prophet. And there was a, a battle, as there often was, between the Philistines and Israel. And they were fighting, and Israel was losing. They decided in chapter 4 to go get the ark and put the ark at the head of the army. And they thought that would give them success to defeat the Philistines. And actually, the Philistines thought the same thing. Look in verse 4, I mean in chapter 4, beginning with the um, um, second part of verse 6. It says, when they learned that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp, this is the Philistines, the Philistines were afraid. A God has come into the camp, they said. We're in trouble. Nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us. When they heard that the ark was in the camp, they were frightened. Now, the problem is, is that Israel was trying to use God. They weren't interested in his presence. They were just trying to use God. And then you find in the latter part of that chapter that the Israelites lost multiple thousands were killed and the Philistines captured the ark. And then in chapter five, here's what they did with the ark. Then they carried the ark into Dagon's temple and set it beside Dagon. See, Dagon was their deity. It was their God. If I remember from my Old Testament survey, I think that uh, Dag Dagon had the body of a fish in the upper body, the lower body of a fish, the upper body of a man. And so in some strange sense, they seemed to be honoring the presence of God. They were honoring the God of Israel. They brought him into the temple of Dagon and he was a deity. They understood he was a God, although a lesser God than theirs, because in, in their thinking, whichever whichever uh, people group won, their God was stronger. So they're saying, OK, we acknowledge you, Yahweh, you are a God, but you are lesser than Dagon. So they set the ark by Dagon. If you've read the story, what happened to Dagon is when they come into the temple in the morning, Dagon is on his face before the ark. Hallelujah. Dagon fell down. So, you know, they decide to set Dagon up again, raise him up above uh, the ark. And the next morning they come in and his head and his feet's broken off as well. And then there's judgment brought up against the Philistines and they decide they'll send the ark from from where they are, they'll send the ark to Gath and then eventually Ekron. And so the, everywhere the ark went, there was judgment. So they said, here's what we need to do. We need to get rid of this thing and send it back to Israel. And their their spiritual leaders in chapter six discovered a way to do this or came up with a way to do this. Verse seven, of chapter six. Now, and I know I'm leaving out a lot, but I don't have time to do to 
to spend with it. It says, verse 7, Now then, get a new cart ready with two cows that have calved and never been yoked. They're about to put this whole idea of whether it's God or not to the test. So they build a, a, a cart and they get two cows that have never been yoked who have calves. So you got a mama cow. Hitch the cows to the cart, but take their calves away and pin them up. Take the ark of the Lord and put it on the cart. And in a chest beside it, put the gold objects. Send it on its way, but keep watching it. Now, we've already discovered, just as I mentioned a few minutes ago, make sure that the presence of God is not subject to anything in your life. They put God in the... They sort of attached Israel's God to their God. And God says, no, I'm not going to be subordinate. Now, here, not intentionally, not intentionally, but here's what happens with us sometimes. We have our lives and we decide to bring God alongside of all the stuff that's going on in our life. We make God an addition to our lives. And I, it doesn't matter whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament or whatever testament. God does not want to be subordinate to anything else in our lives. He wants first place. And, and so there are times that life will go on as usual. But I find that at some point, the Lord wants those other things brought into uh, submission to Him. He wants to be first in your life. He wants to take first place. And sometimes circumstances come into our lives to remind us, now who's first here? He doesn't do this out of anger. But you remember with Abraham, he spoke to Abraham and had him lay Isaac. He asked Abraham to lay the thing on his on the altar that was most important to him. And can you imagine the torment of uh, Abraham, of what he went through before he had to go and place his Isaac? Some of us. And again, I, I I'm, I'm hopefully I'm doing this with love and just by way of, of bringing it to our attention. But many of us have Isaacs that we have to lay on the altar because they are interfering with the presence of God in our lives. We have not made those things, whatever those things are. And I'm not going to start listing them because then I'll miss something. And you, somebody will might think, well, that thing is OK. If there's anything in your life that takes priority over God, it is an idol. Now, he doesn't remove these things out of anger. I, I mean, you can go back to um, Mark chapter 10. Don't don't turn there. Just let me talk to you about it. Where the rich young man, uh, you know, tells this rich young ruler to go sell everything that he has. And then come follow him. And the guy goes away sad because he is unwilling to do that. Now. We think, or at least I've heard people talk about it, is as if, you know, God is judging him. God is angry at this young man. That's not what the scripture says. Jesus looked at him and loved him. And he laid his finger on the thing that was most important in that rich young ruler's life. God lays his finger on the thing or the things that is most important in our life, not because he's angry at us, not because he's upset at us, but because he loves us. And he says, I want you to lay that on the altar. I want you to lay that on the altar. See, God is not going to be subordinate. If we want to host his presence, this is a very important concept. If we want to host the presence of God, it will be extremely important that everything else is subordinate to him. Or that thing may end up on its face. So here we have, back to 1 Samuel chapter 6, we have... The Philistines creating this cart. And it said again, send it on its way, but keep watching it. If it goes up to its own territory toward Beth Shemesh, then the Lord has brought this great disaster on us. But if it does not, then we will know that it was not his hand that struck us down and that it happened to us by chance. Do you get the picture? They have all these things. Read it sometime when you've got a few minutes. They have all these things going on. And they think it's, you know, God bringing judgment they think it's this you know god of the israelites fighting for them but they're not sure so they create this test they're going to examine the fruit of it i wish the critics of renewal and revival would examine the fruit of what happens with us but be that as it may they decided we'll see if this is god or not they create a cart they get cows that have calves 
and they locked the calves in the barn. Now, I don't know how many people are familiar with uh, how that works. Uh, my grandfather was a farmer, and, you, and my, my brother is a farmer. He has uh, 140, 150 head of cattle. And, and you just, I've actually had to help him tag calves. And, you know, he tries to put the truck between the cow and the calf so we can get out and tackle the calf and tag the calf. Because mama cow is going to eat you alive if she gets to you. That was back when I could get in and out of the back of a truck in a big hurry. And so what they do is they set this test up to see if it's God. And then down in verse 12, I love this. Then the cows went straight up toward Beth Shemesh, keeping on the road and lowing all the way. They did not turn to the right or to the left. The ark on the cart made the cows go against their natural desires. Do we carry, this is a good question, do we carry enough of the presence of God to cause us to go against our natural desires? Do we carry enough of the presence of God to cause us to go against our natural desires? Or do we have something locked up in the barn that we want to keep returning to? So they were unable to turn from the right or the left. Their calves were locked up in the barn. Do we have something locked up in the barn that we want to keep going back to? See, just remember, if we don't have a calf, we don't have a problem. If we don't have a calf, we don't have a problem. So, being hooked to the presence of God will help us. It will cause us to go against the natural inclinations of our heart. Now, I love what happened uh, in verse 14. The cart came to the field of Joshua of Beth Shemesh, and there it stopped beside a large rock. The people chopped up the wood of the cart and sacrificed the cows as a burnt offering to the Lord. We are vehicles for the presence of God, are we not? Are we not vessels to carry the Holy Spirit, carry the presence of God? I wrote a, a note here this morning that says, the very vehicle for the presence of God becomes wood for the fire and the sacrifice for the altar. I, I don't know if that stirs something inside of you, but if I'm going to be a carrier of the presence of God, I become the wood for the fire and the sacrifice for the altar. This New Testament talks about us being living sacrifices. I found the only problem with a living sacrifice is it tends to climb off the altar. It's hard to keep that living sacrifice up there. We come to a healing school with global awakening and we climb up. We're on the altar. And then next Wednesday we decide to climb down. We get to church on Sunday. We decide to climb up and be the sacrifice. And then the next day we climb down. We are to live our lives as if we are living sacrifices for him. Now, I'm not talking about beating yourselves down. We are kings. Uh, we're joint heirs with Jesus. We're, we're kings and priests in that sense. We are joint heirs with him. We are royalty. We're part of a royal family. I'm not talking about worm theology here, but I am talking about being living a, a life of sacrifice for him, that we are a sacrifice to him. So the fifth major point that I had hoped to get to the other day was li learn to host the presence of God. And then the sixth one. Then allow God. I mentioned this. I just didn't develop it. Uh, then allow God to touch you again and again and again. I have found with my life, and I think it's true of everyone. One touch is not enough. Now, one touch begins me, it starts us on the process. But I need to be touched over and over and over and over and over again. I want to come to the healing school, the school of healing and impartation. I want to be touched by the Holy Spirit, but I want to be touched the next week. I, I have friends and I love them dearly. We have conversations, discussions about this, never arguments, but discussions and their theology, their particular position is that when you got saved, you got it all. 
I, I think that's still a little bit arrogant. How dare us the, to think that the creator of the universe is giving us all we could get in one fell swoop. I'm not minimizing in the importance of salvation. In fact, I, I don't have any kind of salvific uh, um, thought in mind here. When you get when you accept Jesus, you're saved. I'm not talking about salvation, but Jesus came that we might have life and have it to the fullest. What I find is most Raise that many do not have full life. They're saved. They're going to die and go to heaven. It's sealed. Holy Spirit was given as a guarantee. They're going to heaven, but they don't have full life. See, I want to live not just in heaven with a full life. I want to live it here. I, I, I want to experience his presence. And I, I, I think we can receive over and over a fresh touch of the Holy Spirit. Now, again, I'm not minimizing the importance of that first touch. We had a couple in my church that um, they weren't there when I went. They were from that church, but he was in service. And I was already at Suncoast uh, a while, a year, year and a half, two years. I forget now. And then this beautiful young couple came in. Do you have Ken and Barbie here? Okay, Ken and Barbie. They were the Ken and Barbie of life. I mean, he was a banker. She was a housewife. I mean, they were gorgeous. They were beautiful. And they would come in and they were Christians and they loved Jesus but they would come in late and be the first ones out the door because they had to get to the lake with their boat. And they had a, uh, you know, a nice home. Every, I mean, just the ideal couple. Randy comes on his first trip to my church. I'm shocked that they're there. I'm, I'm literally shocked when I walk in the back door and I see them there. Secondly, I'm shocked. We had a middle aisle because they were in the aisle to get prayer. And Randy goes through and he's touching people and he touches the two of them and they both hit the floor. I'm just, I'm amazed. I mean, I, I, this is not something I thought up later. I'm just amazed. If I remember correctly, I told Brenda, I said, I am shocked that Mike and Dean are here tonight. They get down, they go down and they get up. And in just one touch, their life is radically changed. He came in a few days later to my office and he said, um, pastor, I, I, I pull into the bank and I sit in the car and I just cry. I, said, I don't think I can do this anymore. I want to go into full time ministry. Now, in my heart, you know, I'm encouraging. I'm being very pastoral. I know how to do that. But in my heart, I'm thinking, buddy, you better keep your day job. I don't know that I see anything about full time ministry on your life. Now. It's not very long after that, several, maybe eight, 10 months, 12 months, a year. I forget now exactly. He ends up being on my staff as administrative pastor. They become two of our, I, I guess, best spiritual sons and daughters, my wife and I. And then they reach a place after another touch where God calls them to the mission field. They sell everything they have. They load up everything they own at that point in suitcases and buy a one way ticket to China. They went over. They opened a home for throwaway children, for babies that no one wants. Those with cleft palates and those who have deformities. And uh, they bring those children in and they love them and they pray for them. They have, I don't know at this point, probably 28 or 29. They don't do it alone now of children. And if they if they, if no one will pay for them to have surgery, they'll pay for them. Baby after baby, the doctors have walked to the door of the operating room and handed to her so she could minister to them and take care of them. And uh, because they, they've had their cleft palate repaired. The way she will get her babies is she'll go into the government. My wife was with her when she did this. They go into the government orphanage. She'll go around and love on every kid. And in some orphanages, they've got them tied to the bed, inside the bed. They hadn't been up. They'll just lay there lethargically. She'll go around, hold every one of them, love them, and then go to the director and say, tell me, which ones will die if I don't take them home? They'll say this one, this one, this one. She'll take them home with no hands, no feet, blind. Take them home, begin to love them. And time after time after time, nurse them to health where someone in the States will adopt them. Now that came, they got the first touch, went down, the second touch, sent them to China, and they basically feel they're going to die there. They're, they're, and in fact, I'm going to try to get them back to VOA this year. Most wonderful couple. So I'm not minimizing that first touch, but I'm thankful that they were touched the second time and the third time and the fourth time. I don't know about you, but how many of you want a fresh touch from God? I mean, I know, I understand the thinking. In our thinking, we're saying, well, 
I mean, isn't it enough just to have the Creator touch you one time? Well, I think the reasons, some of the reasons, I don't have all of them, that we need a fresh touch is because really we're so forgetful. I mean, we get zapped. And then we go and we get caught up with the other things in our life. And, and, and so it's not long we forget what God did. We need a fresh touch because we're forgetful. We also need a fresh, fresh touch because we're fickle. I mean, our loyalties vacillate. I, I wish I could walk in perfection. But I don't. I'm forgetful. I bounce back and forth. Another reason we need a fresh touch is because life is filled with challenges. It's filled with difficulties. And we tend to get beat up. One of the things I'm not going to get to this morning is talking about intimacy. And we go through life. And as we go through life, we tend to get slimed. I don't know if you, you have that analogy here. We get slimed. We pick up a bunch of stuff. And so it's when we're in intimacy with him. We're with him that the Holy Spirit washes us clean. And so we face challenges. And the other reason we need a fresh touch from God is because of the warfare. I mean, we're in a battle. We're in a fight. We have a real enemy that hates us, that wants to destroy you, and wants you to forget what you have learned and experienced when you walk out this door. He does not want you to go back filled with anointing, filled with power, and filled with passion. He wants you to forget. He does not want you to remember. The scripture tells us to be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. For our, and tells us to put on the full armor of God so that we can take our stand against the devil's schemes. That God has a destiny and a plan for your life and the enemy has a scheme to stop you. Wants to sidetrack you. So that you can take your stand against the devil's scheme. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. We have an enemy and we're in a fight. And yes, sometimes we get wounded. So what do we do? We go back and say, Lord, I need you to touch me again. I need you to touch me again. Me again. I want your presence. I want to walk in all that you have for me. I want a fresh move of God. I want it to start with me. I want his presence. I want to host his presence. Tommy Tinney. Um, I don't know. Are you familiar with Tommy Tinney? He wrote God Chasers. Uh, Tommy in the early days came to our church. Uh, we had two services then. It was actually one service that started at 830 and went to two. I mean, there were bodies everywhere. The second service had to step over people in the door out in the foyer to get in. But he made a statement, I think it's in his book, but he made a statement that I wrote down. He said, are you tired of visitation where we catch a glimpse of him as he passes by or where we touch his garments as he moves past us in a crowd? He said, I want habitation where I can linger in his presence and I don't lose the sense of his nearness after I leave a worship service. I want his presence I want to linger in his presence. I want his nearness, not just because I've got Holy Ghost goosebumps when Randy is preaching or Will is preaching or someone else is preaching. I want his presence. I want a sense of his presence. I want the nearness so that when I walk out those doors, I'm just as aware. He is with me. He is on me. He is in me. I want it out there just as much as I do in here. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I want you to stand if you would this morning. I know I need to let you break. I hate to even say what I didn't get to. Oh, man. One of the major points that I had really had a desire to make this morning was. You know, once we get his presence, once we're aware of his nearness, what do we do with it? Do we just. Go in a room and shut the doors and enjoy his presence. Now, there is a time for that. But I think he fills us with his presence so that we can then go out there and he can live his life through us. There's some just some illustrations I wish I could give you and some things that happened that would illustrate that point very clearly. But he wants to live his life through you. Paul writes 
in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ in me. Lord, I choose today to live a crucified life and allow you to live your life in me and allow you to live your life through me. Lord, I want to go outside the four walls of this building at the end of this conference and I want you to live your life through me. Touching people's lives, showing them the light. I want to let you live your life through me. Thank you, Lord. I bless you and I honor you this morning. One last thing in the next 30 seconds. Would you just put your hand over your heart? Lord, we again yield our hearts to you. And we're asking, we're asking. Oh, we're asking for your presence. We want a fresh move. We want a fresh wave, Lord. I volunteer. Use me. Use me. Send me, Lord. Today, I remind myself that I am crucified with Christ. That what really matters most is your presence and your desires. And Father, I'm so thankful that many times my desires line up with yours. I'm so thankful that I hear often you asking me, well, what do you want to do? What is the burden of your heart? And then you empower me to do that. Lord, I bless this church. I bless these pastors. I bless the people that have come. Some of them at great cost to be here. I ask that they will leave changed father walking under a greater anointing with a fresh awareness of your presence being used by you to create the next wave thank you father would everybody just say amen